Uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks very much for the invitation, and uh, I'll, this will be um, not too technical. Uh, I know it's very late. You've all been sitting here through many equations over the day, so this will be fairly fluffy, uh, but hopefully entertaining. So, um, in today's talk, I'll just. Can you do the three dots at the top there and get rid of that little box with the X? Do you do you really need that, Toby? Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I'll start with a very brief uh, look back at how we got here um, f from 15 years ago. Talk a little bit more about the limitations and bottlenecks. Um, you know, we've all been working on this type of sensing for quite a while now, so it's probably a good time to reflect on, you know, what we're doing right, what we could probably improve. And then I'll talk a little bit, um, the main part of the talk, about uh, a candidate next generation sensing technology that we've been working on for about two years now. So let's first look back. Um, I remember very distinctly sitting with Toby um, thinking, OK, we're going to sell a camera, right? We're going to be rich. We're going to sell this camera for 1,000 francs. That's about $1,000. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we were really happy that we, someone actually paid money for this, right? That was amazing. And all jokes aside, I think what's even more amazing is that we're all sitting here today, right? People bought that camera, wrote grant proposals. All of you wrote grant proposals, raised lots and lots of money, right? Even got huge companies to start burning money on this stuff. And hence, we're all sitting here today. So I think it's a, um, it's a testament to the creativity and ingenuity of everyone sitting here um, that we've been able to bring this actually very simple idea such a long way. And one of my favorite things in the office is this map. It's, on, it's in our demo area showing little dots where someone's running our software, and that's usually connected to a camera, right? So it's a lot of countries. Um, you can see above the North Pole, for reference, um, our Sydney colleagues, of course, have got it onto the ISS. And what um, not all of you may know is that uh, Guillermo, he didn't want me to say this, but um, he sent one to Antarctica uh, to record penguins. Uh, so that paper's under review, so you, hopefully you'll hear about that sometime soon. So it's been everywhere, right? And so, you know, so what's the point of all of this, right? We've got to get some applications, you know, start justifying all of this money that's been uh, spent on this stuff. And so I'm not going to go through a whole list of these. I'll, I'll just mention three um, representative examples, right? Um, so one I would classify as a sort of industrial vision example. Um, in this one, our customer is actually sticking cameras under trains and doing train slam. Right, and you think, you know, I thought train positioning was a solved problem. Turns out it's not. Um, and so they're currently scaling this up in the UK, and they have some um, proof of concept testing going on in some other countries. The second one is an IoT example. Um, we're working with our sister startup, uh, Synsense, which is combining on a single chip a very low resolution DVS array. It's only 128 by 128 pixels with an ultra-low power spiking neural network. So this is all on a single piece of silicon. It was designed to be as cheap as possible and is designed to do very simple tasks such as um, detecting a face or recognizing a gesture. Um, I call this the teddy bear sensor, and the idea is that it's on your toy, it's on all the time, it's burning no power, and when you pick it up, it starts detecting whatever it is that you've trained it to do, say a face. And it doesn't have to work all the time, uh, but it has to work well enough to switch on the rest of the teddy bear and use very little power while doing this, a kind of a smart on sensor. And so hopefully this will be the first um, mass-produced uh, product using this technology. And then the, the third example I've mentioned here is, I guess, one that's uh, quite topical at the moment that we and other companies are working on, which is event-based eye tracking. Okay, so... We can sort of see there are these different niches uh, where the technology can and could um, find applications. Um, if we look a bit more at you know, what we've been doing, um, essentially up until now we've been trading off um, speed and signal quality. Right? In, the bottom, in the bottom right, you know, frame sensors, they're pretty slow, but they, they take great pictures. Right? That's a good thing. Right? That's why they've, they've done so well, why you have them in all your cameras. 
And event sensors, they've been very fast, that's good, but they've also been very noisy, right, for a number of reasons um, related to the analog pixel circuits and, and so on. Right, and so up until now, you've had to choose one, right, which is very frustrating for people designing products, right? They would like to have everything, right? And so the question is, okay, how can we give them good signal quality and um, high speed in, in the same chip? Right. And so people have you know, done dual camera systems with beam splitters and all this stuff. And um, here's a very quick overview of the different things people have tried. So they've had an RGB frame, then they have the DVS pixels. Um, we have some uh, chips which combine the, the two when using the same photodiode for the events and frames. This turns out to have certain advantages and disadvantages. And there are also hybrid ones where the large DVS pixel is mixed in with lots of smaller RGB pixels, and then you know, by combining these in different ways, you can do uh, different types of reconstruction and so on. Um, but you know, these methods uh, have you know, shown promise, uh, but you're still dealing with two streams, right? You have the event stream and the frame stream, so you're throwing even more data at the problem that you're trying to solve. And this extra um, bandwidth um, starts to become a big issue the, the lower in power that you want to go. Um, in this little cartoon here, I've shown sort of a typical um, power share in a vision system. On, on the left, you have a high power system, uh, for example, let's take automotive, where the sensor uses some power, you know, perhaps one, two watt or something. The data takes some energy to send to the processor, and then the processor is running a whole bunch of GPUs or something uh, to do the processing. As you go down, um, the, the transmission power actually starts to dominate. Right? So you might have a very nice sensor and a very nice processor, um, but you end up burning as much power actually getting the data to the processor as you saved uh, in, in doing all your fancy uh, DVS stuff. And so the question is, okay, you know, is there something we can do about this? Right? We obviously have to send less data right, to get around this problem. And you know, this is something that your eye is really good at. Right? Um, you know, your eye has you know, on the order of 100 million detectors, um, your visual cortex, you know, hundreds of billions of compute units, and somehow your brain, sorry, your, your retina condenses this into what's been estimated at about one megabyte per second, right? So obviously something is smart is going on there, which is general purpose, fast enough, and really, really low bandwidth. And so, you know, the, the, long, the very long-term goal is to work out what that is, but, you know, we have to sort of uh, set ourselves um, achievable goals uh, in the meantime. And so we've been working on a um, new technology called the, the Avion sensor, um, which aims to give uh, users the benefits of the very high speed, the high dynamic range, you know, um, also be able to have small pixels with good signal quality and have on-chip data reduction of different types. And um, here's the obligatory corporate uh, animation. So it's kind of like the DVS animation you've seen before, except um, now we have these cores, uh, these event cores, and each of those covers a different small part of the pixel array. Um, what's important to note here is that this is mainly digital. Right? We've moved qu uh, quite a distance away from the um, analog circuit in current DVS pixels, and we're actually using uh, more or less off-the-shelf um, CMOS pixels with known uh, good performance characteristics. Right? And so... Um, it's a unified pixel architecture. Um, this means you can have the one-bit events. Uh, you can read out the full pixel. You can also read out multi-bit events. So no longer can, um, do you have to send out one bit. You can actually get the magnitude of how much changed. Um, this is all happening losslessly. Um, you can have high speed. The dynamic range uh, is also very high uh, because we have an internal floating point representation. And uh, you can act, the pixels can actually adapt um, on an individual basis. Oh, no, I'll come to this in a sec. So one of the drawbacks of DVS up until now has been that the um, response characteristics have been fairly constant, um, independent of the lighting level. And this can be a problem when it gets very dark. Right, Your signal-to-noise ratio is much lower when it's dark. And um, this means that you're getting a lot of noise events which are using up energy and bandwidth but not actually telling you much about what's going on in the scene. 
And so the, with a new sensor, you'll, you'll be able to um, have intensity-dependent response characteristics in a curve, which you can uh, set on a per-pixel level and also update uh, during operation. Um, so this is one way of basically reducing unnecessary noise data, which is not telling you anything about the scene. Um, each of the cores can be configured differently, so you can basically have multiple ROIs across your scene. So in this example, you may want to monitor um, the, the global scene in binary, for example, just to know roughly that there's something happening there. And if there's a particular thing that you're interested in, then you can choose to collect you know, more data in that area. So this is one of the ways that you can shape your data stream so that um, you're focused mainly on what you're interested in. <coughs> so what does uh, this look like um, in, in practice? So the chip doesn't exist yet. Well, we're getting very close to the first tape out of it now, but because it's in digital, we were able to create an emulator uh, for this uh, for the chip. So uh, here you can see typical one-bit events and uh, typical reconstruction. I know there are many fancy ways of doing deep network re uh, reconstruction. This is just a very trivial uh, one-bit um, integration uh, reconstruction. And on the bottom part, you have the uh, multi-bit events and then the reconstruction, which is basically just adding. Right. Um, so there's no need for any deep networks or anything. Um, we have a couple more examples here. So uh, this one you can see is a high-speed hummingbird. Um, you may see some small artifacts there. That's because uh, this is actually a 5-bit um, data that's being sent. Right. So it's, um, I didn't just copy the source video and put it there. I mean, it is actually the output uh, from the emulation. But it still gives um, definitely much better results uh, than what's possible using the one-bit DVS. Um, here's an example of a typical uh, type of output you might use in eye tracking. Um, this one is a kind of a whole camera moving thing in an, an automotive type of scenario. And this is a type of reconstruction you might get uh, in a full camera motion drone kind of scenario. And so the question is, okay, does this reduce data? And the, the answer is yes, uh, otherwise I wouldn't show the slide. Um, nothing's free, uh, so it does cost more data than using the one-bit DVS. Um, the test cases we've run indicate that it uses anywhere from the same amount of data to about double the amount of data uh, for a one-bit DVS, and the, the thing you get for that is the uh, high-quality reconstruction. Um, it's actually possible to reduce this data again back towards the one-bit um, DVS, and there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, what you can see here is a way of uh, handling edge cases. So one edge case um, which generates a lot of data with DVS is if it's dark in the room and then you switch on the lights, right? Or in, or in this case, you have a flashing siren, right? So there's a lot of events being generated here. And so instead of encoding every single pixel event individually, what we do is we encode the mode. So the, the most common change upwards, for example, and then the outliers um, to give the, you know, individual, uh, the individual pixel values. Uh, so in this example, you're seeing just the modes, right? Otherwise, it would be quite hard to visualize. But you can think of this as kind of like an event JPEG, sort of. Yeah, very, very rough analogy. But again, <coughs> it's a way of um, moving the DVS concept away from single pixels to small patches of area, of area right? And you can, imagine, you can all imagine where this might go uh, in a couple of generations from now. Um, we also have motion encoding. Uh, this is, again, you know, looking at um, compression, looking in the, in the neighborhood. This is not optical flow, right? It happens to look sometimes a little bit like optical flow, but it's actually, because it's looking in a very small neighborhood, we're not making any claims about this being an optical flow thing. Perhaps you can take this data and improve it you know, to get decent optical flow, but um, what we're concentrated on here is um, data reduction, right? And so by using these two methods, it's actually possible in some cases to get the, the total bandwidth down below the, the one-bit DVS, right? Because it's just a much more uh, efficient way of encoding the information, uh, particularly for whole camera moving scenes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, all of these points here on this slide, but the, the overall message is that uh, with this um, architecture, we're able to 
um, combine the small pixel size, the, the good uh, performance of the uh, of the uh, current frame sensors, uh, with the high speed um, of the um, DVS that we've been used to up till now. And by doing this, we can and having the cores, which you can of course scale, um, you're able to scale up to um, arbitrarily high resolutions um, that you are used to in your you know in your phones and so on. Um, here are a couple of sort of a very, very rough sample specifications uh, for the types of uh, sensors that we're envisioning. Um, and you can see, you know, the pixel pictures here are typical uh, for these types of sensors, and the resolutions are as well. Um, you can see the number of cores uh, required to, to make this type of sensor work, and the, the die area is also uh, fairly typical uh, for this uh, in a stacked uh, sensor technology. Yeah, so uh, that's that's uh, what I have to say. Um, I realise you know I've probably left out a lot of details, which is true. Um, I hope hopefully next next year at CVPR uh, we'll be able to give you a lot more details. Uh, thanks a lot.